I hope by being here today that uh, what we say and what we do brings peace, brings calmness, and hopefully it brings some kind of encouragement. Though I don't think the lesson is necessarily an encouraging, fluffy type of lesson, I hope in some way just being together does bring encouragement to you. We're going to be looking in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17 and going through verse 24. I want to remind you that when we began this study in the book of Ephesians eight weeks ago, which I called a brief study, I did say what I've said so many times. I said that the Old Testament, with all of its many stories and all of its many directions, is really written for one purpose, and that's to tell us that the Savior, a Savior, will come to this earth. And then you open the New Testament and you have these first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they tell us the story of this Savior coming to the earth whose name is Jesus. They tell us about his birth, about his death and resurrection, and in between they they talk about how he lived and what he said. And then there's this one little book, the book of Acts. It's so unique, not another one like it. It's where this story of Jesus after his resurrection was preached. And it's a story of all the people responding to the preaching. And everything else in the New Testament, this letter to the Ephesians, the letter to the Roman church, the letter to the church at Corinth, all those letters are written to kind of explain how those who responded to the preaching in the book of Acts are supposed to live. And it's kind of interesting. It's it's not specific and hard and do this and don't do that. And it, it doesn't tell us things like when to meet on a Sunday, and it doesn't tell us what to do when we get inside this building specifically. What it primarily tells us is how we who have come to know Jesus, who have responded to the preaching of Jesus, are supposed to live. And that's what this passage is introducing, how we are supposed to live as believers in Jesus Christ. Remember when we were kids, we used to play this game, and we had a long rope, and we would sometimes tie a knot right in the center of the rope, or we put a flag right in the center of the rope, tied to the rope. And you have one group on one side pulling, another group on the other side pulling, and we would call that game a what? A tug of war. Well, maybe that's what this passage is going to be talking about, a tug of war, a spiritual tug of war. Because on one side, you have the people who believe in Jesus, and they're holding onto the rope, and they're pulling, and and you have the people who don't believe in Jesus on the other side, and they're pulling with all their might, and you might get the wrong impression. You might think that the two are enemies, but certainly for the people who are the believing side, they're not enemies to the people over here. In fact, they would like for them to come over to their side. But the one who are unbelievers are pulling all the while that you and I might be pulled back into the life we used to have. And the pull is really, really strong. And so with all that, I want us to read verses 17 through 24. We're going to read it out of the easy to read version. I think that translation speaks this passage better than any other one I could find. And then we'll simply try to figure out what it says to us. So let's read the passage that Burke puts on the screen. I have something from the Lord to tell you. I warn you, don't continue living like those who don't believe. Their thoughts are worth nothing. They have no understanding And they know nothing because they refuse to listen. So they cannot have the life that God gives. They've lost their feeling of shame. And they use their lives to do what is morally wrong. 
more and more they want to do all kinds of evil. But that way of life is nothing like what you have learned when you came to know Christ. I know that you heard about him, and in him you were taught the truth. Yes, the truth is in Jesus. You were taught to leave your old self. This means you must stop living the evil way you lived before. That old self gets worse and worse because people are fooled by the evil they want to do. You must be made new in your hearts and in your thinking. Be the new person. Be that new person who, is ma- who was made to be like God, truly good and pleasing to Him. So, the question is, what did it say? What does that passage say? What did you hear it say? And Bert's going to try to keep me in order here and keep me kind of going, but, but I, I, I want you to see the observations that I make from that passage, what it, what it simply says. And look at the first. Unbelievers don't know. They don't know because they don't listen. They don't understand what you and I are about. They don't understand how you and I think. They don't understand why we believe what we believe. I I read a story this week, and the story was written by a man who uh, I didn't know, but apparently some really well-known person. And he talked about how ridiculous Christianity is and how ridiculous the people who follow Jesus are and how they don't know anything and how dangerous they are. And then I was reading this passage, working on this Sunday's lesson, and realized Paul declares they don't know because they don't listen. And then he says this, unbelievers waste their lives. They're wasting. They could have such wonderful opportunity for so much but they are wasting their lives. And you heard me say as late as last week that time is moving so quickly. And and we're already into the month of May. And before we blink our eyes, it's Memorial Day holiday. And before we blink our eyes, it's July the 4th holiday. Susan and I left early Wednesday morning and had to be in Lubbock for a funeral by one o'clock. And this funeral was of a lady we've known for years and years and years. But in the last few years of her life, maybe the last dozen years of her life, she's had some rare form of MS type thing. And in the last couple of years, she's had to have 24 hour care and a doctor on hand at all times. And, but we, we listened to a beautifully done service about how her life was so vibrant and, and all that she was doing and then what it's been like in the last few years. And from the funeral, we walked away and we drove just about a mile away to a nursing facility. It was a memory care facility. It was people who had advanced dementia or Alzheimer's and And we went in to see a woman who we've known for years and years and years. And her husband came and her son came and her daughter came and 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 she couldn't she couldn't really get any words out. But she knew who we were. All she could really get out was tears. Tears. Because she could see us, she wanted to talk to us. It was such frustration. And Susan and I left thinking, literally thinking and saying, isn't it a shame to waste 
one single moment of this life. Isn't it a shame to waste one day because of a bunch of petty things, and yet we will do it. We will do it. But for all those who are unbelievers, Paul says they're wasting, they're wasting so much. They could have so much more. And he said, here's what their lives look like. They lose their shame. They get involved in so much evil because they won't listen to what Jesus says. They lose their ability. In the Old Testament, it says to blush. They're not embarrassed about any kind of activity anymore. And along with that, they are morally wrong. And along with that, this last one's really important. The evil gets worse. The evil gets worse. Now, let me tell you something. We have some people in the audience who are in their teens, and they don't understand that statement. We have some people who are in their 20s. They don't understand that statement. Maybe people in the 30s don't understand that statement. But I understand it. I went to high school in this same town. And there was evil going on. I I, I guess the evil was doing things, little things we shouldn't be doing, and a lot of people drank beer. But it wasn't until I was finishing my first leg of university life at Oklahoma State that I began to hear about something called drugs in this town. And I began to hear about someone dying in this town because they overdid it on drugs. And I thought, Literally thought, what are drugs? I don't even know what it is. And now it's everywhere. It's, just, it's, it's accessible everywhere. It's getting worse. And when I was in high school here and would watch television with my family at home, we had three television stations and only three. And we would use... Shows like, you you won't remember these, but My Three Sons and Family Affair and the Donna Reed Show or maybe The Rifleman as a Western. And The Rifleman always, always ended with a good point. And you go to the movie place down here in town and you would watch movies And there would never be bad language, and there wouldn't be any explicit material. But then a few years pass, and they start putting ratings on shows. PG-13 and R and X. I used to have X. Now it's unrated. And on our television sets, we can get 100 channels. Or if you really want to go big time, you can get 200 channels. Plus, you can stream some things. And the language is horrible. And the scenes are unspeakable. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I've complained about it getting worse. And now I read what Paul says. And he said, quit your complaining. Understand that's the way it is. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And so the one side is pulling against us. And for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ and follows Jesus, it's pulling against us. It wants us to come back into this world. But Paul says in this passage to all of us these things. As believers, we're supposed to know better. What do we know better? We know what Jesus said. Paul said, I am giving you something the Lord gave me to give you. You were taught the way Jesus said to be taught. He is the truth. You want to know truth? Go to Jesus. He's telling you the truth. 
you and I are supposed to know better. And he says, what you really need to understand is that when you became believers in Jesus Christ and you entered into his space, his kingdom, his body, his church, we became new in heart and in mind. Now, the mind is really important. That easy to read version really used the word thinking. You begin to think differently. And when you think differently, the, the, the motives of your heart, the desires of your heart change. And your behaviors change. And we know that's true. We know it's true with this body, don't we? If you change what you eat, does the body change? Some of you have been on a diet in this very room, and you've been on a diet for many, many weeks. And guess what? We can see it. We can see it. Because you changed. Susan and I both went to the doctor Friday. She, she, she was willing, I was unwilling. But he said, it's been a year and you need to come. So I went. I don't like him drawing that blood. But it's what he calls kind of an annual checkup. I'm not even sure it's an annual physical, just an annual checkup. We're in the room together. I didn't like that. And he's talking to both of us. I think he thinks we're geriatric because he wants to do flexibility tests on us. He, he wants to raise my legs. See how high my leg, leg will raise. I say, it'll raise higher than that. I do sit-ups all the time. I raise my legs straight up all the time. And, and, and he said, well, what do you do about exercise? And I, I, we began telling about exercise, what we do, five and six days a week. He said, that's why your legs are raised up. I mean, it, it's, it's real simple. And he said, what about your diet? I said, well, I got a strange diet. He said, you know what you eat's going to change, how you're able to function. You know that, don't you? I said, I drink this drink every morning. I've been doing it for 13 or 14 years. I told him I was in the drink. I said, I haven't had a an episode of gout, which I used to regularly have since 2013. He said, it has changed the inside of you. It's changed how your body's reacting. It changes your metabolism. But can I tell you something? I will occasionally tell people about my drink, our drink. And occasionally people will try it. Virtually no one stays with it. Maybe one or two. Because they don't think it tastes good. They don't think it has the right texture. And we all know that exercise is important. I don't care how old you are, exercise is important. Ask what I did, I said, I jump on a trampoline. I jump on a trampoline every day. You jump on a trampoline? How weird are you? You know? Uh, but the point is, people don't want to do that either. And many days, I don't want to do it. But you make yourself do it. And that's the problem. Because you're being pulled all the time. Because I'm telling you, instead of that drink, you could drink, well, you don't have to drink at all. You can eat sausage, and you can eat bacon, and you can have fried eggs, and you can have fried toast, and you can have donuts. Sounds good, doesn't it? And I'm trying to pull you over to the other side. And that's exactly what's happening spiritually. We have to be made new in our hearts and our minds, and that's exactly what was happening in the book of Romans. You, you remember, Paul, Paul, Paul said everything I'm saying this morning in one sentence. In, in one sentence, 
in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Now, I'm not used to reading out of the easy to read version, but I stayed with the easy to read version. Don't change yourselves to be like the people of this world, but let God change you inside with a new way of thinking. You know, we used to read it like this. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? The way you think, your mind. So that then you will be able to understand and accept what God wants for you. This is what God wants for us. And you'll be able to know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. But even with all of this, the tug keeps coming back and forth. And if you tied a ball in the middle of that rope or you put a little flag, sometimes it's pulling me more and more to this side. In fact, if you stay in that book of Romans and you jump down to chapter 6, they're having a problem with this new person concept. They're having a problem. The people in Rome knew about Jesus. They had heard the preaching of Jesus. They had responded to the preaching of Jesus. And they were excited about this newfound salvation. But the tug kept pulling them back. And they wanted to go back to that former life. And they wanted to watch all the movies they could watch. And they wanted to, well, they didn't have movies. But you understand the concept, don't you? They wanted to go back. It's so appealing. Because the way Jesus talks about it is a narrow little road. And I've heard that narrow road concept talked about so many different times and so many different ways and butchered so many times. This is the narrow way. That little tiny way that believers walk where most people refuse to do it. It's as simple as that. And they're being pulled back. And Paul writes to him and says, I can't believe my words. I can't believe you're living like this. But they've made it easy for themselves because they say, we can go back over here and do like we used to do. And God's grace is so great, and it is great, by the way, that he'll just take care of us still. We know about Jesus. He'll just take care of us. And Paul says, don't. In one translation, he says, God forbid you think like this. Did you forget that all of us became part of Christ Jesus when we were baptized? In our baptism, we shared in his death. So when we were baptized, we were buried with Christ, took part in his death. And just as Christ was raised from the death, from the death by the wonderful power of the Father, so we now can live a new life. He said, just go back and think about what you did when you responded to the preaching of Jesus. And you were raised up to be a new and different person. Just stick with it. So what's the point of all this? What's the point of all this? I told you it wasn't that encouraging, okay? But it is important. Look at the last point. You and I just have to pull hard. If I'm going to stick with my metaphor or whatever that thing is called, or my tug of war, we just have to pull hard on the believer's side. We just have to hold on to that rope and pull hard. And hopefully, out of love, we can talk to some people who are pulling on the other side, and they'll come over to our side because they don't know any better. And their evil is blinding them more and more. For a while, I was getting so frustrated by watching the direction of this world. Now I've kind of backed off, and I'm not so frustrated. I'm feeling more sorry for it. Because they just don't know what they don't know. They just don't know what they don't know. And the only way they're ever going to know what they don't know is that we tell them what they don't know. Gently, and with love, and with kindness. We want them to come to our side. But we don't dare 
let them pull us over there. Why? Because Jesus died for us. And Jesus gave everything he had for us that we might have an abundant life here. And I promise you, your life may be dull to some people, but your life is envied by many in this world who would like to be where you are and living like you're living. You've got the abundant life. And you've got promises beyond the abundant life. Major promises. Because of what Jesus did. And, and, and be, he, he did it so we could have this. What a shame to give it up. What a shame to give it up. So let's stop at this point and let's remember by way of the Lord's Supper that we are who we are because of what Jesus has done. Well, I have one last slide. And I didn't send this to Burke. In fact, when Burke sent it back to me, I thought, what's he doing messing with my material? But then I looked at what Burke had done, and I thought, <clears throat> that's actually pretty good. That's a pretty good way to close. Burke, show him the last slide. There's a time coming when there'll be no tug. There's a time coming when we'll be at what we often use as a cliche, the end of the rope. Because time will be over. We won't have to be worried about people pulling us back into that world. We'll be in heaven with Jesus forever and forever. But that concept makes the idea of staying the course in Jesus Christ all the more important. Just staying with it. You may not like the drink you have to drink every time. You may not like the walk you have to walk. You may not like to have the pressures you have to have. But we have to stay with it.